Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Natalie Sayer, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. Before we begin, please silence all phones and electronic devices. Additionally, please refrain from any interruptions to the debate as it is being recorded for on-demand viewing and post-captioning services. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform and public education measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. The system provides clean funding for qualified participating candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules. These include contribution and spending limits, foregoing special interest money, and participating in commission debates. We encourage audience questions, so please utilize the note card given to you when you entered the room and hold it up. Our volunteers will pick up the cards and deliver them to me. If you need additional cards, just raise your hand. If you have a question for a specific candidate, please include the candidate's name on the note card. It will be considered during the second half of our debate. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on can candidates. The debate is scheduled for up to 90 minutes, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Tonight's debate includes one minute opening statements. The first half of the debate begins with two minutes to each candidate to answer the same question. After all the candidates have responded to the question, the first responding candidate will be given an additional 30 seconds. We will rotate which candidate responds first. The second half will allow for a different question per candidate with one minute to answer. Some questions will have an optional 30 second response for the other, comment, the other candidates to comment. And finally, one minute closing statements. We ask that you remain polite to all of the candidates and give them a fair and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with anything being said. Tonight's candidates. We have Ms. Wendy Garcia, a Democratic candidate for state senator in District 22 and a clean elections participant. Mr. Frank Carroll, a Republican for state representative District 22, also a clean elections participant. Ms. Valerie Harris, Democratic candidate for state representative in District 22, a clean elections participant. And finally, Ms. Terry Sarmiento, Democratic candidate for state representative in District 22. The order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order by last name, starting with the Senate for opening comments and will progress from that starting point. The order for the second half will be determined by reverse alphabetical order by last name, starting with the House. Wendy, will you start your opening comments, please? I will. Thank you so much. So good evening, everybody. My name is Wendy Garcia. I'm campaigning to represent you in the Arizona State Senate. I founded Indivisible Surprise. This is a grassroots group which focuses on community education, as well as communication with members of Congress. I also help to organize Save Our Schools Arizona here in the Northwest Valley. I'm an experienced radio news director. I'm also known as a fearless activist. As a grassroots leader and a fearless activist, and a radio news director, and all the other titles I've held, none have been more important than the title of mother. I know the importance of protecting vulnerable communities' rights. Thank you. Mr. Carroll, or Frank. Or Frank. Well, I'm <laughs> Frank Carroll. I'm the Lone Ranger tonight, in the Republican Party representing our district. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my two partners in crime here, so to speak, uh, Ben Toma, unfortunately he's out on business, so he's been gone all weekend. He's not gonna be back until Wednesday, so he'd miss this opportunity to be here. And, uh, and David Livingston, of course, he's being appropriations chair. In spite of what they say about this being a part-time job, it's uh, gonna make its demands on people all year round. So he's un unfortunately unavailable to be in attendance as well. So just about myself, I'm pro-family, pro-taxpayer, and pro-constitution. 
And I stand by those guidelines, and, and there's a whole list of things that I'm sure we're going to cover tonight talking about this side of the aisle and the view and our perspective from our ideology, and I'm sure there's some things we may find in common tonight that we agree about. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Valerie. Hi. I'm Valerie Harris. Thank you to Clean Elections for hosting this, and thank you all for being here, and thank the candidates up here as well. Um, Arizona's been my home since I was nine years old. My kids were born here. They were, they were raised in the West Valley. They're settling down and raising their families here. For 37 years, I worked at American Express. I worked with small businesses, mid-size, and large corporations, helping them manage their corporate card programs and their budget. I learned to listen to understand, to think creatively, and I learned the value of creating strong relationships, especially with those I didn't always agree with. Our current uh, Arizona leadership has shown that it values special interests quite a bit more than it values the uh, working families of this district and state. We need legislators who are going to work for the people and not for the, for the parties. As your representative, I want to work for education and the environment and the economy. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. And Terry. Sure. Hello, I'm Terry Sarmiento, and I'm running for the Arizona House of Representatives. And it's fitting tonight that I'm wearing this necklace because I inherited it from my mother. Um, and so much about who I am and, and, and why I'm doing what I'm doing, I learned as lessons from her. When, in the early 80s, she first applied for her first credit card from J.C. Penney's, it came in the mail, and she didn't even know it was for her because it said Mrs. Robert Stevenson. She said, that's not who I am. So she spent the next year fighting them and getting them to actually issue it in her name. She, she was very proud of taking her father, my father's last name as I was when I got married, but she knew that there has to be a balance, right, between respecting old traditions and pulling yourself into new futures. And that's what I feel like is missing here is a balance. As I've gone and I've talked to people in this district, I feel like it's been one party for far too long that isn't listening, that isn't representing all of the voices in this district. And that's what I'm doing. Thank you. At this point in time, we will begin the portion of the debate where each candidate will have two minutes to answer the same question. Remember that the first responding candidate will also get an additional 30 seconds. Frank, we'll start with you. What is your greatest concern about Arizona's economic future and why? <coughs> We are uh, making progress in this state and growing our economy. It could be growing at a faster rate. There's no question of that. We have a lot of uh, factors that come into play as with our infrastructure, with our uh, public safety, education as well. Those things are on the table. Um, also, one of my big concerns is, is that we just don't uh, arbitrarily go out and make tax increases, especially if we, we focus on a particular sector of people in our economy. Uh, there was just an attempt by Red Fred to get a proposition on the ballot which was targeting a specific group of people. Uh, that tax increase would have effectively uh, doubled our income tax here. It would have also affected uh, the inflation adjustment that would normally be there and cause the taxes to go up on everybody in this state. But the big impact would have been it would have slowed down our economy, our economic growth, because those that uh, do create the jobs in our state, uh, those were the first ones that would be impacted. So my concern there would be is that we don't be a detriment to those that rely on their source of income, that rely on their uh, 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 livelihood to be affected in that by that kind of a thing. So. Um, so that would be something that I would oppose. And even if it came up in the legislature, you know, seriously looking at how we fund things, I think we can do it without raising taxes. So that's probably one of the major things right there. So thank go you. Go right ahead. Valerie. Can you repeat the question, please? What is your greatest concern about Arizona's economic future? And um, why? I think the the one of the big issues that, well, we have a lot of issues, actually. Um, the economy, it, we, we hear how good the economy is, but at this point, um, Arizona has the fifth highest 
um, rate of poverty in the nation. We've got 18% poverty um, across the state. The national average is 14.7%. We have four in 10 kids that live in poverty. We have uh, a quarter of the jobs in Arizona right now pay minimum wage. What we really need to do is to have jobs across the state that pay a living wage. Um, in order to do that, we need to have a workforce that can attract the high paying technical jobs that are out there that aren't coming here because we are not educating our children to their potential. So the biggest thing that I see challenging our economy is the fact that we are not funding our education as, as we should. And that would be one of the, the first thing that I would want to do is to work on getting that funded. I would also want to look at who, who, who are the people that are in poverty. The majority of them are single women and um, families with small kids. Women that are um, domestic violence survivors um, trying to, to put together a life on their own for their kids. So we need to have um, support for the kinds of for those for the those women and the people who are living in poverty. And I think that's part of what the state needs to do is to put forward programs that are going to be beneficial for them. All right, thank you. Terry. So the what I think of the greatest economic issues facing uh, our, our state today has a lot to do with the way our state is growing. We have 222 people net increase, population net increase on a daily basis in this state. How do we sustain that kind of population increase and have people thriving in the communities they live in if we're not creating jobs that work for them today and in the future and if we're not educating the workforce that's going to be filling those jobs? So if we've got that kind of explosion in growth in, a, in, a, in populations, we have to make sure we're educating kids to be able to hold jobs that support a family. You can't support a family on minimum wage, and that's pretty much what you get out of high school right now. It now takes an associate's degree or a technical degree, some kind of technical education to support a family. So if we are not putting money into the very foundation, which is education, and creating not only from the very bottom, K through eight through 12 up, but the technical schools, the, the junior colleges, where people can get those kinds of degrees or training, then we are not preparing people for the fact that we're going to have this enormous population increase and no jobs to create thriving communities around that. Thank you. Wendy. So this is a great question um, and one of my deepest concerns and frankly one of the reasons that I'm running for Arizona State Senate here in Legislative District 22. My greatest concern for our economic future is certainly public education. If we aren't creating a well-informed workforce, a well-informed population, then we're cutting off of our nose to spite our face. So in order to uh, create a better economic future, we need the kids to be educated. We need them to be able to go out and get really good jobs right out of high school. So we really need to be addressing the funding that will be necessary uh, in order to accomplish these things. Um, and everyone agrees, we need a bigger pie. I, I keep hearing this over and over, we need a bigger pie in order to uh, accommodate the things that we need to make public education better so that we can have a better future for our economy in Arizona. And I'll be talking a lot about that tonight. I did get, I did get the warning. I didn't see you. Um, so we're going to be talking about that tonight and um, the things needed uh, to better support public education, which is including funding, but many other things need to be addressed in this way. Um, a quick example would be, of course, accountability. Um, look, we really need to have the same standard set across the board, no matter what the choice is. 
Uh, that's fairness. And in fairness to the kids, to our future. Thank you. Frank, 30 seconds to respond. Well, I hear some good points in here as well about in conjunction with growing the economy and uh, educating our young. I know for a fact that back in the 1980s, I saw the decline of vocational training in the public school system. I saw that up in Chicago. And apparently that's happened all over the United States. You talk to some of the industry leaders in uh, areas that require, say, drivers and operators of equipment, uh, tradesmen, uh, they're very deficient on a uh, population to support that industry, so something to look Thank at. Thank you. Next question, Valerie, we will start with you. What is your position on each of the propositions? There's 125, 126, 127, 305, and 306 all on the ballot this year. You want me to recite that by number, or would you what, <laughs> help me out and tell me? <laughs> so 125, public retirement, 126, taxpayer uh, taxes mm -hmm. on service providers, 127, clean energy, 305, the uh, ESA expansion, and 306 is clean elections. I, uh, I, sub I uh, do not support the voucher expansion, 305. I don't believe that uh, I... Expanding vouchers at the expense of public education is not something that I support, and it's not something that is supported by the people that I've been meeting with in my district. Um, the 306 is the clean elections one, correct? Mm -hmm. I do not support that one because I don't agree that um, clean elections should be put under the jurisdiction of the governor. I think it needs to remain um, distinctly independent. Um, it gives us a forum for being here, um, getting our funding from uh, for our campaigns without having the uh, influence of corporate investment or dirty money. Um, Which one is 106? Um, 127 is clean election, 126 is taxpayer, and 125 no, is public retirement. No, 127 is solar. 127 is solar? Yes. Or clean energy. It's clean clean energy. energy. Okay. I do That's support. I do support that one. I do want to see us uh, mandate more solar power. Um, I don't think that APS needs to continue to profit off of the rate payers um, and get and keep investing in fossil fuel and keeping us support, um, dependent on fossil fuels. Um, as far as the retirement, um, I don't think that needs to be changed. I don't support that. I think it should remain the same. And what was the last one? The last one is um, the taxpayer. I believe it's uh, 126. The taxpayer. So um, it's like freezing. It's Freezing taxes so you can't tax services, I believe. Oh, is what I it is. don't support that one either. I don't at all support that one. That doesn't need to be as part of the Constitution. And we, we need to have options left open for the legislature going forward. Excuse me. All right, thank you. That's kind of a hard one to be the first person on. <laughs> so, Terry, uh, again, same question. What is your position on each of the propositions okay. and why? Okay, so on 125, public retirement, I do not support changing public retirement. Um, on 126, the tax uh, taxing services. You know, this is um, kind of a, a silly que question I think we have out there because are, are you guys aware that it takes a two-thirds supermajority to impose any new tax in the state of Arizona? So it, it's sort of a mute point here putting this into law, but um, I, I don't support the idea that we can say we will never have a new tax on anything. There's far, far more places I'd like to go for inefficiencies to get money um, before uh, I would go to a tax, but um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, say a definite no on, on going there. 127 clean energy, I am for, because why would APS put $18 million into something, follow the money? There's a reason they're trying to get us to to, uh, to fight, uh, to, to, to strike that down. It's because it cuts into their profit. We have the most sun of almost any state in this nation. We should be using it. 
Um, on 305, I am a no because it is a subsidy, vouchers are a subsidy for those people that will be sending their children to private schools anyway, and it takes dollars directly from public schools. And, you know, the classroom costs the same to air conditioning whether you've got 35 kids or 33 kids. A bill is still the same. Um, and then on 306, clean elections, we need to protect that, and I don't, I agree with Val, it should not be under the governor's control. All right, thank you. Wendy, same question. So, <clears throat> um, Prop 127, I'll start with that. Uh, for me personally, it's a yes vote. Uh, I think this is a terrific plan for healthy kids and clean air in the state of Arizona. We need it. Uh, we're, we're asking um, for, for ways to make Arizona better, and this is, <laughs> this is a great one, in, in, in my opinion, um, requiring more electricity produced in a uh, higher, more sustainable fashion, yes. So Prop 126, the uh, taxing services, um, no, it limits what local government can do. So I am a no on Prop 126. On Prop 125, which um, uh, is all about state and corrections officer pensions, which allows for a cost of living adjustment, I don't see anything wrong with that. So I'm a yes vote on Prop 125. On 306, the clean elections, I'm a hard no on that. We absolutely need to uh, keep the, uh, the Clean Elections Commission an independent body. So this brings me to Proposition 305. This is um, uh, something I am personally happy to see on our ballot. So uh, I am no, 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 no on Prop 305 all day long. Why? Because it's taxpayer dollars without oversight. It takes money directly out of our public education systems. It siphons it away from our kids. And we shouldn't do that. We should be supporting public education with every breath we take in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Frank. Well, let's go down the list here. 127, I'm a no on that. All right, that should be left to the, to we as a people here with our, through our utility, utility companies deciding how we're going to generate our electricity. And we have so many things available, including, oh, excuse me, including the solar as well. But when we look at the way this is structured, it disregards our nuclear plant, uh, which is a clean source, it, it does. And then it disregards the fact that when you look at what California has done with respect to this, and that's where a lot of the funding for this proposition and the backing came from, uh, their rates are extremely high. And now it leads and opens the door to the next phase of things in the future, which will be mandatory perhaps solar panels on all new construction, something that they're doing out there as well. And all it does is force the cost and make it so that people who are in a position can't afford homes or have a tough time doing it, make, putting it further out of reach for them, let alone the impact it's gonna have on jobs. And it's just not APS, it's other utilities that are here as well. Uh, on 126, the tough thing about that is the fact that uh, for the services industry to be speaking up and saying, you know, we don't want taxes being imposed on us. I understand the concept and I well appreciate it. Uh, the only other side to this is the fact that, and it was mentioned here about the legislature, that it is the legislature's function to tax. Unfortunately, uh, this kind of treads two areas here. Whose domain is it? And is this going to be a special interest exemption? So. Uh, so I'm still a little out on which way I'm going to go in that there. Uh, the uh, 305, the SA, I'm all about parental choice when it comes to this. Whatever you call public education, the money that's allocated for it, the parents are in control of their, their children's destiny when it comes to education, and they should be participants in it. And sorry I can't give you the rest there, but time's up. Thank you. And Valerie, your 30 seconds. Um, I would just like to reiterate that on uh, Proposition 305, I sincerely am opposed to Proposition 305. I don't think it's good for the state. It's certainly not good for public education. Um, it, there is, there's absolutely no accountability. There's, there's going to be money going out of the state treasury um, or the general fund going to public 
or uh, away from public education going to private schools without any accountability on how that money is spent. Thank you. So I'm going to remind the audience that uh, we are closed captioning. And even when you have a collective murmur of whispers, we actually pick that up. So um, can you uh, please try to refrain from vocal outbursts during our debate? Uh, next question, we will start with you, Terry. What will you do to increase the number of good paying jobs in Arizona overall and in the Northwest Valley in particular? Economic development is one of the most important issues to me. You know, I grew up out here on the west side in the shadow of Luke Air Force Base. I am raising my family here on the west side. We, when 90% when of the population commutes out of Surprise, out of Peoria, downtown Phoenix every day for a job, there's a problem. We need to increase our economic opportunities right here in the West Valley. Look at, we have plenty of land, we have the infrastructure as far as the, the freeways, we have three regional airports, why are we not using them? We should be a leader in biotech, in, in healthcare, in, um, in finance. Where this starts is being a leader in education. I am a business owner, I own my own business. I get that people will re not relocate their companies here if they don't think the kid, that the kids are gonna get a good education and, and wanna put their children the employees are not gonna to wanna to put their children in schools. So it is a two-prong approach, right? If you've got fantastic education like they do in other parts of either the city or other states, people bring their companies there because they know they can get the most qualified workforce because they're attracted to that area for different reasons. So we've got, we're fertile ground here on the west side with our inexpensive land and our, and our standard, high standard of living with a low cost. But it's a, it's a, we've got to have the educational base to support it and be graduating people who are competent to go into those jobs right out of high school or right out of a junior college. All right, thank you. Wendy, same question. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Terry, uh, and I agree with you. We absolutely have to be supporting uh, public education if we want to grow the economy. Um, so the question is, how will I grow the local economy? So certainly by supporting public education, but um, I'm gonna do a lot more than that. Um, gonna quickly touch on um, what my overview of the economy is and, and my platform in that regard. So we all know about the five C's, the um, cattle, copper, climate, citrus, cotton, the five C's, I'm going to expand on that. Um, let's add three more C's, construction, conservation, and computers. So these are the future um, that we need our kids to be working on. And I am going to also expand uh, by saving taxpayers money to grow the economy. Uh, in, in my effort to do this, I'm going to propose, I have proposed that we cut the Arizona state sales tax by 50%. No audible murmur. <laughs> uh, so yes, if we want growth, we need to put money back into the economy. And cutting sales taxes will stimulate the economy even more than anything that we, that we can do. Reducing the sales tax rate will increase the economic uh, status in the state through volume. Um, this will increase revenues and grow the total pie. So we'll be working on public education and making sure that it has um, all the funding it needs. We'll be making sure it has accountability and we'll be saving taxpayers money. And that is how I am going to grow the local economy as your state senator in legislative district 22. Thank you, Frank. Well, I like the sound of that, cutting taxes in order to attract business to this, to this community here. Uh, additionally, the education thing, which I, I've mentioned it earlier, there's uh, definitely on the vocational side, there's other areas. You can, you can set education to whatever you want to tune into as far as the type of businesses that you'd like to have in your community. So that's doable. Funding it is doable, all of that. Um, Logistically, where we lie here as a city of Surprise, for example, we have some road systems that need some considerations to improve the traveling to and from this area. Um, that's something that has to be addressed as well. That's part of our infra infrastructure consideration. Uh, 
this is something that I'm sure businesses look at is how well it's easy to come to their location. Obviously, they're moving commerce material back and forth. Uh, what do we have? There are the 303 right now coming up this way. All that land that's alongside of it can be developed. Uh, this town of Surprise, the town of Peoria, uh, we have plenty of land that we can expand and, and have places for families to take residence here and, and, and uh, bring people in from the other states as well, attract them from higher tax areas like California. Uh, there's a lot of techie people out there as well that we can bring into our community, bring into our fold and expand our economy here as well. And grow the base, so if the base becomes bigger, we don't have to raise taxes down the road. What happens now is we have a larger pool of money to be drawing off of and keeping tax rates low. So that's a good idea about lowering right, taxes. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. And that's it. I'll just leave it at that. I'm sorry. Do I get a discount for 30 seconds off? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Valerie. I think um, the fundamental thing we need to do is to uh, focus on education. In order for us to grow our uh, economy and uh, have good paying jobs, we have to have a workforce that will attract those jobs. We need to um, invest in education so that our students come out of high school with the skills they need to be successful. Um, we need to invest in um, uh, vocational schools and junior colleges for the students that don't necessarily um, fit in a, a university environment. Um, we need to be able to have these, these kids come out of these um, programs with certificates and be able to hit the ground running and get jobs that are um, high paying so that they can, they can afford to um, start their families and start their lives. Um, our public school system has great opportunities and choices in the um, CTE, in the in the career and technical and, uh, and uh, engineering programs. Um, our public education system is, offers a, a number of innovative school choices so that our students don't have to step out of the public school environment to get a, a very, very good education. But we do need to make sure that we can fund them to have smaller classes, that we can fund them to uh, get these programs going so that they can uh, come out of school and get these jobs. Um, our uh, employers, the high paying technical jobs from California that Frank was alluding to, they aren't going to come here if we don't have a workforce that can do the jobs that they need them to do. So that is primarily what is going to um, provide good jobs in the Northwest Valley and in the rest of the state. Thank you. Thank and you. Terry, your 30 seconds. You know, I'd like, to, I'd like to have everybody walk away tonight with the word innovation stuck in their head. When we do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, that is the definition of insanity, right? So let's be innovative. We talked about all these new jobs that we want to bring to the west side. How are they going to get there? What I don't hear people talking about are the fact that we have commuter rails all up and down Grand Avenue. Why aren't we putting commuter trains on those? Getting people from Surprise down to Central Phoenix. Why isn't that something our current representatives are doing? Thank you. Innovation. <coughs> okay, Wendy, we will start with you on this one. So given LD22 has various demographics, um, one of the audience members wants to know the east side of LD22, what do you see as their issues and how would you address them? Well, <clears throat> look, everybody's issue here <laughs> Um, specifically to the east side and all throughout Legislative District 22, we need to improve on public education. So we need to grow a, a bigger pie. So in order to do this, um, we need to be saving taxpayers money. So whatever the issues are, wherever they are, if you have a little more money in your pocket, well, I bet those issues would be better, <laughs> easier to address. So this is exactly why I am proposing that we cut the Arizona state sales tax rate, we cut it in half, and save every man, woman, and child uh, $700 a year. Those are the numbers we've come up with um, according to the Arizona uh, State Joint Legislative Budget Committee uh, and their fiscal year estimate from 2018 also from the Arizona Department of Revenue Projections for 2017. 
Um, look, uh, saving every man, woman, and child over $700 a year equates to about $2,800 for a family of four. This helps everyone. I want to do this because it's fair. Uh, cutting sales taxes is more fair than income and property taxes. Sales taxes, as you know, are more regressive compared to the other uh, sources, the income and the property taxes. Um, so it gives more money back to working people and middle class. Okay, this spreads the benefit out to everyone. So whatever your specific needs are, as we see our pocketbooks grow and our economy grow, we can solve a lot of problems with that. Um, cutting the sales tax rate will stimulate the economy, uh, reducing that rate by 50% from 5.6% to 2.8% will increase the economy through volume. So that's an Thank important you. aspect as well. Thank you. Frank. Well, I assume the east side, whoever's in here, they've got something on their mind. I wish they would have expressed it in the question and said, okay, this is my concern here. And it probably would help all of us to go and pointedly respond to it. Uh, but I'm assuming we're talking about the Arrowhead area, Glendale, and a uh, little bit of Peoria over in that vicinity there. Uh, a lot of that is retail business, so definitely uh, tax sales tax structure is a consideration. Uh, if they need, I don't know specifically what it is that we're focusing on here because you got the ballpark there, you got a number of other restaurants and everything establishments that operate in that vicinity. So if there's issues there, I'd like to hear what they are so we can come to a more uh, accurate response to that. I think that's all fair to all of us up here. And um, the other thing to keep in mind too with LD22 is we've got a census coming up. So this is probably gonna be our last two years uh, geographically being 22 and I'm sure that's gonna change into something else and whether the east side becomes part of the rest of Glendale and Peoria remains to be seen. So that's something else to put on the table as you're weighing in, okay, what works for our area? Because I know for a fact being out here in Sun City West and being a member of the Republican Party and active and I kind of mentioned this uh, pre before the, uh, in some of the talk we were having up here. You know that river that runs by Surprise there between Sun City and Surprise, north and south? Uh, there's just something about it geographically that just defines people on this side and says this is our community and this is our part of 22. And then on the other side, that's the other area over there. And it's not that we're at odds with each other, it's just that sometimes on the two sides of the river, there's a little different view about what's important for that part of the community. So you have to keep that in mind as well. So if it could have been more specific, probably a different kind of response, but uh, whatever it is, I'm sure we're gonna be open to considering what we can do to help with the situation, whether it's Republican or Democrat, so. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Valerie. Um, I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm also kind of guessing as to, to what the question is uh, specifically. I know that you know on the east side we've got the demographic there is um, younger families with their kids in school. Um, the things that concern them are around education, around the the, the future of their their kids. I know um, my kids are actually starting their families in that area. I've got grandkids that are going to school in the Peoria school district, and uh, and there's a lot of concern there about you know, living paycheck to paycheck, um, worrying about if uh, an unexpected car repair or a, uh, a medical issue comes up, are they gonna lose their home? So there's a lot of concerns about, you know, just hanging on to a lot of the, that, uh, the younger families that are starting out. Um, I think in, they, they tend to, you know, the people that I have spoken to in the, in the east uh, part of the valley tend to look at the west part of the valley as more established and uh, a little bit less concerned about how the younger demographic um, gets by. But whether that's right or wrong, that's some of the things that I'm hearing when I'm talking to people. And I can, you know, what I want to do is to make sure that everyone gets a chance to be successful, that the the people in the East that are worried about their jobs and they're worried about their kids' futures, that they get the public education funding so that they know their kids are gonna be 
in good shape, that, that we grow the economy so that everybody has jobs and they don't have to worry about what happens if they get an unexpected car repair, that the people in the western part of the district don't have to worry about um, what's going to happen with their Social Security or Medicare. So, Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, 30 seconds. Terry. Oh, sorry, Terry. Terry. <laughs> I apologize that I was marking you off like I'd called on you. <laughs> Terry, two minutes, please. Thank you. And the question was, uh, what about the east side of LD22? What are their issues from your understanding, and mm -hmm. what would you do about them? Well, I tell you, I have been all over this district in the last year since I announced running, really, in every single precinct, every corner. And surprisingly, I'm hearing a lot of the same things over and over. And uh, some of those things have been brought up, and that's a feeling of economic security, a feeling of am I going to make it if we have a catastrophic problem. Um, surprisingly, education seems to be something that comes up as equally on the east side as it does the west side in the retirement communities as often as in the communities with, with predominantly younger people. And I'm really just hearing a lot of the same things, which is that nobody's listening to me which is that we have had one-sided politics out here for so long, and it's been sort of this, this one-sided game, this winner-take-all politics, that no one's actually listening to me and my needs. People often say, you're the first person that's ever even knocked on my door, whether it's the east side, north, west, south, it doesn't make a difference. You know, I think people in general are all concerned about the same things. They want safe communities, they want health care that doesn't bank the, break the bank. They don't want to go bankrupt like like my uncle and his family did where they lost their, his business, her job with the business, their home they, in foreclosure. She finally had to divorce him because on access, they paid more for his nursing care with Alzheimer's than, than as a married man. People shouldn't have to live like that. Those are the things that people everywhere in this district are dealing with on a daily basis. And these are the reasons that I'm in this race, to let people know that I'm listening, that, that you have a voice and somebody out there is listening to what you have to say and that we can change these things. All right, thank you. Now, Wendy, your 30 seconds. Sorry about that. So the question um, was specific to the east side. And can you repeat it? Sorry. What about the east side of LD22? What are their issues from your understanding and what would you do about them as a legislature? Well, I'm with Terry. Look, everywhere I go, all over this district, doesn't matter if it's in Sun City West, doesn't matter if it's in Surprise, Arrowhead, uh, the Happy Valley area, Glendale, everybody is concerned about public education. So I'm absolutely a strong proponent and um, will do everything within my power um, to support it, sustain it, um, and make sure that education platforms in Arizona um, Thank are, you. are sustainable. Thank, Thank you. So at this point in time, we will switch to the second half of our debate. So the questions will start with you, Terry. Um, audience, I remind you that you can do directed questions, so you can actually write questions to a specific candidate. And uh, we will continue to use those throughout the second half of the debate. If you need more cards, just raise your hand. So these are one minute to respond. And some of the questions I'll announce, uh, this will have an optional 30 seconds for the other candidates to respond. If you would please just raise your hand. If you want that 30 seconds, I will call on you. OK, you ready? So Terry, your first question. Um, if we have 220 people uh, increasing in Arizona, how many are leaving? Do you have those statistics? That's a net increase population. It's 222 net every day. So that's the final number after the, we have the influx and the, and, the, and the people leaving. Okay. So that was a simple there question. There you go. <laughs> All right. Valerie, your question. So Adja, as a legislator, uh, what would you do to bring corporations and jobs to the west side specifically? To the west side specifically. We have, um, we have a lot of land on the west side that is not developed, that could be developed. Um, I think there's an opportunity to attract business out here. Um, 
in a number of ways. Um, I think um, providing them, obviously, with a, with a good workforce is going to be the first thing to do. But once they, um, when, a, when a business is out looking for some place to locate, they can come out to the West Valley. We've got inexpensive land. We can work with them on um, perhaps tax incentives that have a, a, an end mark where if you bring us a certain number of jobs, that you guarantee those jobs. If you don't bring them, then we get your, then your, your tax break is at an end. Um, there's a, there are, uh, thank you, sorry. So uh, Frank will direct this one to you and there'll be an optional 30 second comment period should you want it to the rest of the candidates. Um, do you support the privatization of public schools and what would, how do you support that position? Do I support the privatization of public schools? Public schools. So, what's your position, and why? Well, I never even considered the thought of privatizing public schools at this point. I think uh, the important thing that I see out there, I mean, I'm hearing good things about making sure we fund and support education. Okay, I look at it from the perspective of all students have the equal right to education in the state by parental choice where they want to go. So when we talk about money, we allocate it according to, if you go K through 12, how many students do you have? That's really the breakdown. Now we get into another area and we start talking about school administrations and their accountability in that. There's a Goldwater Institute study right now that's out there and it's pointed some issues that need some accountability within the certain districts. And they do demonstrate that there's some waste of our taxpayer money. Okay, so those something on Besides the support for education, we have to have accountability as well. So that would be my response there. As far as privatizing, I mean, I don't even know why that's a question at this point because public <coughs> schools are public schools. They belong to the districts. So go there. Thank you. Optional 30 seconds to respond. Wendy, I see your hand. Can you, um, you mentioned the Goldwater Institute identifying waste. Can you be more specific, please? So this is actually uh, you commenting, not you asking questions to your opponents. Okay. Did that take 30 seconds? No, <laughs> keep going. I'll get a redo. Uh, I'll take it later, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I would like to say that um, I think accountability is hugely important, and I think a big gap in accountability exists in our charter schools. I think um, what needs to happen is the public schools and charter schools, every single school that is getting public money in any fashion should be set, held to the same standards of accountability and financial transparency. And that goes for private schools that are getting um, voucher money. Okay. I do want to comment as well, which is okay. that, um, you know, I'm a mom and I run a tight ship at home. We have a budget and where there's waste, you cut it. And there should be transparency with, with budgets, whether it's public, private, charter. Mm -hmm. sure However, do. if you're looking at public schools and, um, and choice to go public or private, it's not a real choice when you're taking money from one to give to another. You're taking the footing out from under one to prop up another. That is not a real choice. And that should just be something that's made real clear when people understand what they say when they say they're pro-school choice. Thank you. Wendy, your question will also do an optional 30 second. Please raise your hand so I can see that you want the time and um, I will call on you so that the timekeeper can keep us on track. So Wendy, your question, one minute to respond. Um, do you agree that public school teachers in Arizona should be certified and highly, highly qualified? Why or why not? Oh, I absolutely agree. Certified teachers matter. Uh, look, uh, somebody who isn't a certified teacher is not going to have the skill necessary to manage a classroom. Um, look, with 20, 30 kids or more in a classroom, we need to know that that individual is skilled enough to make sure that each one of them is managed in assignment and behavior. Um, certified teachers matter because um, their level of education uh, can handle the, um, the intricacies of not only classroom management, but also teaching tolerance 
I think that's very, very important. Um, certified teachers matter uh, because they have the passion in their hearts um, to, to do that hard work. Thank you. Optional 30 seconds, I see you, Valerie. <laughs> um, I um, work for the Deer Valley Unified School District, and we have had experience where we are, at this point, short of teachers. And we have had um, the opportunity to take advantage of the governor's um, new rule that you can hire teachers that aren't necessarily certified. Um, our experience with those uh, individuals as they get into the classroom, they're faced with um, 20, 30 kids, and they can't take it, and they leave. So I think that's not successful to have uncertified teachers in a classroom. Thank you. Okay, so we will move on to the next question. Terry. Let me just, this is a very long written question. So given scandals that we've seen in the legislature the last year, what would you do to set a good uh, public servant example and bring accountability to elected re representatives? We'll also do the 30 second comment on this one. Well, I'll tell you the first thing that I would do when I get into the legislature in January is create a bipartisan support bill for ethics mandating you know a certain level of ethics in our state legislature look at the corruption and controversy and chaos we have had we had a bench warrant out for one of our legislators because he couldn't stop speeding you know we had another one you know putting money in his pocket because he owns charter schools but he's but he's uh pushing legislation towards uh towards these charter schools we have another one that that through a sexual harassment scandal had to leave and we had a special election in april costing you and me, the taxpayers, $3.5 million. That's 80 new firefighters. I'd rather have 80 new firefighters. So ethics is so critically important. That's example we set for our kids. I don't want to set the example that lawmakers find ways to get, at it, get through loopholes. We should be setting the example of, of being ethical, law-abiding citizens. OK, thank you. Optional 30, Valerie, I see your hand. Um, I come from uh, 37 years with American Express. And every year, we had a spate of compliance trainings where we had to learn about things like money laundering, um, compliance issues, sexual harassment. Every year, we had to take a training. Every year, we had to sign a, a document that said that we know what it is and that we are not going to do it. I think something like that might be of value to our legislature. Thank you. OK, I saw Wendy first, then Frank. Wendy first. So, um, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I, I love your idea, Terry. I, I think that's wonderful. Um, I, I also think we need to be addressing uh, dark political money in our legislature. Uh, look, if, if our legislators are um, listening to their, their financial donors, um, more than they're listening to people, then we have a real problem further to this. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, okay. 30 seconds goes by fast. It, it, it certainly does. Frank. Yeah, there's, there's no question with uh, some of the things that you guys have described that taken place in the legislature and there was a commitment, uh, at least verbalized by the Speaker of the House, I think it was, to the effect that we were going to set these, these uh, protocols and standards as far as ethics go. Uh, so there's a benchmark. So new legislators like our stuff, when we come in, we have that that we're working off. But even though it should be understood before we get there, just as individual personalities in the room would abide by them being civil servants and being civil in nature. So uh, it needs to be Thank done. Thank you. So. Valerie, your question. Uh, what should Arizona be doing to foster our relationship with Mexico in light of concern talking around the wall, children in detention, and trade? Well, Mexico is one of our strongest trading partners as a state. Mm -hmm. I think um, that that relationship needs to be encouraged. It needs to be um, protected. We need to make sure that 
we need to make sure our border is protected, but we need to have a way to have trade come and go um, expediently and safely. We, we don't need uh, to further the law. We can do what we need with uh, technology. And I, 30 seconds is not long. <laughs> You have 30 more oh, seconds. Oh, okay. Keep going if you have more. I'm sorry. I was. Um, I think uh, what we need, to, you know, we need to, to be able to have our businesses work with their businesses very, uh, freely and create an environment where that is going to be fostered and uh, encouraged. All right. Thank you. Frank, this is only going to be for you. Um, what would you support legislation, or what is your position on uh, legislation to make discrimination illegal based on the basis of sexual orientation? Repeat the question one more time. Just what so is your position okay. on legislation to make discrimination illegal on the basis of sexual orientation? Do you have thoughts on that? Well, being that I'm, I was raised Roman Catholic, I have some particular views with respect to it personally. In respect to the law, we have our First Amendment right that uh, comes into play here. So uh, we have to tread carefully on things that are considered discrimination laws because there's been examples where there have been attempts to utilize that against people that uh, didn't subscribe to that view. And there's cases right there that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So we cannot conflict with those individual rights. So okay. simply that, that's all I'll say to it. Okay, thank you. Wendy, this one is for just you. How much money will your tax cut save? Well, we, we covered this already, but I'll say it again. My tax cut proposal uh, is estimated to save about $700 per individual. If you pay a sales tax, then you're going to save money. Um, for a family of four, about $2,800 a year. That's, um, again, every man, woman, and child saving $700. And it'll add up uh, over time and build and build and build the economy right there at the, at the point of purchase. So again, um, my Arizona sales tax uh, reduction proposal um, of 50 percent, yeah, the numbers are great. Um, $700 a year, $2,800 uh, for a family of four, and I want to reiterate that uh, those numbers are based on the Arizona Department of Revenue projections from 2017 and the Arizona State Joint Legislative Budget Committee uh, from fiscal year. Thank 18. you. All right, Terry, your next question, and it'll be just for you. Uh, would you support a conflict of interest and code of ethics rules for all legislatures? And this is specifically relating to the improprieties of charter school owners, but. Without a question, I would, and I don't think it can be made, speci it can be made specific to charter school owners, but it, I think every legislator should abide by a code of ethics. Just like as a real estate broker, I am held by our real estate code of ethics. Um, you know, that is part of, of, that is part of who we are as Americans, is abiding by a certain code of, of operation, of the way we operate in the world, the way we operate personally, the way we operate um, in our communities. I feel like that should be the minimum standard that a legislator is held to, and I support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Can I say something? That was just for Terry. Um, Valerie, this will be for you, and we will have the optional 30 seconds on it. Uh, would you vote for ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment if you are the state representative? Absolutely. Would you like to add or expound on that position? I think that that should have, we've been waiting for 40 years for that to be ratified. We are one state short of having it ratified. It should have been done decades ago. And it's one sentence. There is absolutely nothing in it that should be controversial or socialist or anything else that I've heard used 
to describe it. It is simply that sex is not a, a, a basis to discriminate against a human being. So absolutely. Thank you. Anyone want to 30 seconds? Terry. Again, I don't understand why it's taken so many years for us to ratify this. Women are, are, have been activated this year because they have seen the fact that they have worked, we have worked so hard for so many decades, and it feels like within the last couple of years, everything I've worked for, my colleagues, my friends, my mother, her colleagues, her friends, it feels like it's crumbling around us. And I'm not going to stand up for that. And, and I am so excited to see so many women, Thank not you. only running for office, but Thank standing you. up to say this is important. Thank you. Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, Frank, your question. So, and I'll do the optional 30 seconds on this. What are your thoughts on how you might ensure affordable health care for the senior citizens? Well, it's interesting that that question comes up because my parents are dealing with uh, my dad's health care issues that's been going on since the first of the year. And unfortunately, they're having to reduce their assets that they worked all their life to save up for uh, in this situation. One of the things that uh, I've come across and I've per personally experienced um, there's a Dr. Jeffrey Singer out there and he talks about uh, where the patient relationship to the health care being provided, where the costs and controls fall into play. When you have insurance, whether it's government insurance, whether it's uh, private insurance, you don't have dictates in it. So the idea is that if you can go in and negotiate better prices for your health care, which you can do, but I wish I had more time to elaborate on it, but unfortunately, doesn't quite work out the way it should. And uh, uh, that's something that we need to address from that perspective is that the patient has more control over the health care and the cost. Thank you. Uh, 30 second comment, Wendy, I saw you first. Yeah, I, I'd just like to point out that uh, I think the future um, and the past of health care has been established. This has been established, for example, by hospitals. Um, any medical care professional has to take an oath, the Hippocratic Oath, to first do no harm. So we'll never, we'll never see that you know somebody sick or injured being turned away at a hospital. Uh, the difference is whether people have insurance or Thank not. Thank you. So it's health care for all. Thank you, Wendy. Terry. I would like to just remind everyone that the biggest recipient of Medicaid dollars are elderly women in nursing homes. So if we, if we agree that, that affordable health care for seniors is actually something that benefits the rest of society, we need to be working to protect Medicare and Medicaid. And so that is necessarily something we can, we can support at this level, but we can do everything we can to make sure that that is supported and continued on a, on a national level. Great, thank you. Okay, Wendy, this will be the last question of this round. What will you do to protect voter rights uh, to be able to cast their ballots, and would you repeal ballot harvesting? Well, the first thing to protecting voter rights is, you know, we need to be making it easier, not harder to vote. Uh, so knocking people off of the voter rolls because they haven't voted in a while, um, I'm, I'm a no on that one. Um, look, the cornerstone of democracy is our power to vote. So we absolutely need to be supporting that ideal in everything. Making it more difficult to vote uh, is is the antithesis of who we are as Americans, I think. Um, so that's number one. We need to make it easier to vote. 
And number two is we can't, we can't be um, discouraging the vote by, by knocking people off the polls. No, we need to, we need to Thank support you. voter rights in that way. Thank you. 30 seconds on this one. I see you, Valerie. Yeah, I think, um, I think what we need to do is to uh, enable people to automatically get registered to vote when they get their driver's license. And, and that way people don't have to go out and, and go through registering and remember to change addresses or remember to do that. It happens automatically. I think that's going to be go a long way towards making sure that everybody is empowered to vote. Terry? So it, it, for, for those of you that may not have, have been in Arizona for more than 10 or 15 years, you may not know that we used to be on federal preclearance uh, for our election systems because we were one of 10 states in the union that did such a poor job back decades ago in kicking voters off of the rolls. So this is something that is alive and well in this state, and that's why it's so important to continue to address people being kicked off inadvertently or not, and continue to have these discussions in the public and the public record about this. Thank you. Going once, Frank? All I'll say is it's a right and responsibility that goes with it, just like I always do, is I make sure my house is in order so I can participate in the elections. And yes, it has happened on occasion where there was an error in the record and I got bounced out of there. And I know of other people that experience the same thing and that's all I can say to that is it, your rights come with responsibilities as well. Anything else is just to, to throw it out there and say anybody can vote and just once you're on the rolls permanently, that's it. It's not necessarily a good thing. That's how Chicago has all those dead people voting there. So, thank you. Uh, take it from there. So, our first closing statement, we will uh, have Terry deliver. One minute closing statements. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for clean elections. And um, I'm so glad I had the opportunity to get to know you guys. I, I started out by telling you a little bit about my mom and how she influenced who I am and why I'm running. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my dad who's sitting right here. Um, when I was born, my dad gave this necklace to my mom in the hospital. And my mom was a fighter. She's, she is the reason I, I, I have the grit that I have. She lost her fight to cancer in, in November of 2010 when I was pregnant with my son, Leo. Later on that year, when, I, when, when I, he was born, my dad came into the hospital and he gave me this necklace. And what he didn't have to say but was unspoken was that he was passing the torch to me to take on the role for fighter and advocate for our family. And as I have been crisscrossing this, this, this district for the last year, what I've realized is that that is what people are looking for because they feel like they have not been heard, that their voices have not been heard in this one party system we've been having for the last how many years here. I Thank am here you. to listen to you. I Thank hear you. you when I'm listening. Thank you. Valerie. Um, again, I'd like to thank Clean Elections for hosting this debate and all of you and everyone up here. Um, over the past several years, um, our elected officials have been so focused on special interests and staying in the legislature that they've been ignoring the people that they're supposed to represent. Every one of you deserves a representative that is going to listen to your concerns and then is going to, to champion your causes in the legislature. Your voice is important. I've been listening to our neighbors across the valley, or across the district, the district um, at, at their front doors, at their kitchen tables, at parks, and what I'm hearing is that they are very much in support of public education. They want to see it funded. They don't want to see vouchers expanded at the expense of public education. They want to get dark money and the corruption that it brings out of our state government. They're tired of working paycheck to paycheck worrying about if they're going to have a car repair or a medical expense that is going to to, to cost them their home. Thank so, you. Thank you. I'm Valerie Harris. Frank. Well, I'm Frank, Par Frank Carroll. I'm the only Republican up here. So uh, if you are voting Republican, hopefully you remember to support me here when the, when the ballot does arrive in the mail or if you're doing it uh, in personal appearance. Uh, the other two Republicans for your, your district here, 22, are Ben Toma for the House and David Livingston for the Senate. And uh, I just say thank you to Clean Elections for having us here. And ladies, it's nice to get acquainted with all of you. And uh, it's interesting that we have some things that we agree on and some we definitely don't, but uh, that's the way life is. So 
thank you all for having us, and God bless you. Thank you, and Wendy, one so, minute. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so my question is uh, at the closing of this event this evening, where is David Livingston? Uh, because we have a real problem here. Our, our, our legislators, they don't listen to everyday people. So my name is Wendy Garcia. I am running for the Arizona State Senate in Legislative District uh, 22, and I will serve by and for the people of LD22. I'm going to save taxpayers money, improve public schools, expand health care coverage, increase good paying jobs, and restore democracy. I want to thank the Citizens Clean Election Commission for uh, putting this event on uh, this evening and um, also for you being here tonight. Natalie, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy Garcia, uh, I would really appreciate a consideration for your vote. Thank you. So to our candidates, we thank you so much for participating in our forum as the audience applause indicates. And to our audience members, we thank all of you who took the time to come and educate yourself and inform yourself before voting. We encourage you to visit www.azcleanelection slash voter dashboard for a customized experience to find information on the general election, the candidates and the issues and to view this debate on demand. Please fill out the debate evaluation form and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission and will help us in future debates. Thank you all for coming tonight. You are most welcome to stay and speak directly to our candidates. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much.